Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Please accept our humble obeisances. Please send me. All glories to Shri Prabhupada and all glories to your holiness. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to you. Maharaj, before you start, I'll make just one uh, announcement, Maharaj. Yes. Is it okay, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, devotees, uh, thank you for uh, logging in for the second class of our uh, Bhakti Vai Bhava Unit 6. Uh, one humble request, whenever you are contributing in the class, uh, please raise your hand. Maharaj will uh, call out your names, then you can answer. Please don't jump into the answer. This is a humble request. Hare Krishna. What you, Maharaj? Actually, I need somebody to help me there. I need somebody to tell me that hands are raised. And they can come. Ah, okay. Somebody wants to volunteer for this? Uh, maybe Anuradha Mataji, you can help? Okay. Anupama Radharani Mataji, she, she is volunteering for this. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, we can begin. Yes, Maharaj. Om Jnana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Nathasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Panchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we're continuing with our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam for Bhakti Mai Bhav, we're on Canto 2, Chapter 1, First Steps in God Realization. So here we can see one slide, connection with previous lesson. After reassuring Parikshit Maharaj by mentioning King, King Katvanga's example Sukadeva Goswami begins to explain the process of mystic yoga by which one may achieve the supreme destination. The preliminary stage of this process involves meditation on the universal form as described in the second half of this chapter. All right, in the first section of this chapter we heard about the importance of chanting the holy name. We spoke about how to improve our quality in chanting of the holy name. And then we heard about Maharaj Gadvanga, who only had a moment to prepare himself, but he was able to be successful. So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami was encouraging Maharaj Parikshit. Sukadeva Goswami. Recording in progress. Sukadeva Goswami also gave himself as an example of someone who was attracted to hearing the glories of the Lord. The pastimes of Lord Krishna are so attractive that even liberated souls, avadudas like Sukadeva Goswami, were also attracted to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit that he wants to hear and he knows of course Maharaj Parikshit as a devotee of the Lord. So the two have come together and so many other persons are also there to hear. Naturally two great personalities like Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami coming together, it's a very special event. And it attracted many other people, many other great sages and rishis, saintly persons. Uh, we see even Narada, Vyasa, they all came. They were all eager to hear the discussion. 
All right, so uh, this is the overview of the sections which we have to cover today. We only covered the first 13 verses. So, Sukadeva Goswami recommends detachment from material life. Naturally, Sukadeva Goswami is a renunciate himself, so he's going to encourage others to follow his path. And he encourages Ma uh, Maharaj Parikshit and all of us that before death, it's good if you can somehow leave home and practice self-control in a sacred place. We should chant here it says the Pranav Mantra Omkara, and the mind will become progressively spiritualized. Thereafter, by meditation on the form of Vishnu, come to the level of devotional service. So here you can see a gradual process is being described. First of all, Sukadeva Goswami is going to recommend detachment from material life. And in order to detach yourself from material life, generally it's required that we should get out from the home. Because the home is the place where we become most entangled and most attached. So it's a preparation. Get out from home and go to a sacred place, go to a holy place, go to the temples. And Go somewhere where you can really chant the holy name and where we can really absorb our mind. All right, so he's going to describe about this uh, pre preparing ourselves for death, getting out from the home. And then the, the last section of the chapter, Sukadeva Goswami will describe meditation on the gross universal form of the Lord, because there is nothing more than that in the material world. One who does not concentrate his mind upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead will be misled and will cause his own degradation. So meditating on the universal form we're going to be discussing today and uh, for materialistic people it's, it's a very helpful process of bringing herself closer to coming to devotional service. So the meditating on the universal form is described, of course, we, ha we heard about it in the Bhagavad Gita, it was there also in the first canto, and here it's coming again in the second canto, it comes in the third canto, we'll hear several places. So here's a another breakdown of what's in the chapter here, what we have to cover. Sukadeva, six, text 16 to 21, Sukadeva Goswami describes renunciation and the mechanical process of meditation for neophytes. Neophytes meaning people who are not able to contemplate the personal feature of the Lord. So they are considered to be neophytes. One who is able to actually engage in the Lord's devotional service, then he's not considered a neophyte. They're actually, if someone's actually able to worship the personal form of the Lord, that's, that's devotee, it's already advanced. But neophyte, they're very materially attached and it's difficult for them to contemplate the transcendental form of the Lord. So they have mechanical process for meditation. And then te text 22 to 25, Sukadeva Goswami will describe the process of meditation on the universal form. And then 26 to 38, to the end of the chapter, the conception, we'll hear about the conception of the Virata Rup, or the gigantic universal form. So a few verses will just describe, Sukadeva Goswami will describe about the process of meditation, but then he will go on to describe about 
how we conceive of the universal form. Okay? So, how to develop spiritual desires. This is from the Srimad Bhagavatam, verse number 15, purport, because we have to purify the desires. Preparing for death, we have to give up all material desires. We want to leave the material desires behind. But we cannot stop desire. So we have to cultivate the, the higher level of desire. Prabhupada explains here, what one must have a chance for better desires, otherwise there is no chance of giving up such morbid desires. Desire is the concomitant factor of the living entity. The living entity is eternal and therefore his desires, which are natural for a living being, are also eternal. One cannot therefore stop desiring, but the subject matter for desires can be changed. So one must develop the desires for returning home, back home, back to Godhead. And automatically the desires for material gain, material honour, and material popularity will diminish in proportion to the development of devotional service. So, th this is the point that where Sukadeva Goswami was talking about leaving the world, retiring from home, get going out from home. And so when you go out from home, you don't want to bring all your desires with you and you don't want to bring all the attachments with you. We have to change the quality of the desires. So developing that higher uh, subject matter, the, the chance for better desires rather than morbid desires. So. This was, this was what's required and Sukadeva Goswami wants to put this into the mind, make it clear to Maharaj Parikshit. Mm -hmm. And that was described there, if you see text number 15, at the last stage of one's life, one should be bold enough not to be afraid of death. But one must cut off all attachment to the material body and everything pertaining to it and all desires thereof. So in this way, Sukhad, uh, Srila Vyasadeva is described like that, the, how we have to detach ourselves. Okay. Oh. What about those who are waiting, who for various reasons are not able to chant, right? Somebody may say like that. What about those for various reasons are not able to chant? So, you're preaching to this man, looks like a wealthy man, maybe he's an important man, maybe a mayor or something, and the devotees come to talk to him. So the man says, well, what about the, you know, I'm not able to chant, you know, I'm so busy, I have so many things to do, what about, so how, how could we reply? And so we say, those who are not able to chant the name as recommended above can chant the pranav omkara. This mechanical process for training of the mind will lead to self-realization. 
some people are very prejudiced, you know. They, if you ask them to chant Hare Krishna, they think, oh, this is something religious. I'm not going to chant. I refuse. You know, sometimes I would give lectures in yoga studios. And uh, one time I was giving lecture in a college. In a college I was teaching a yoga class. And I asked them, you know, I taught them about chanting and I showed them the beats and I asked them to chant. But someone got very upset, you know, didn't want to chant, you know, I'm a Christian, this is not my religion, and it's like this, they couldn't understand that Krishna consciousness is non-sectarian. So sometimes, you know, it, it's easier to get people to chant Omkara than to get them to chant Hare Krishna. If you start them off to chant Om, get them to chant Om, <laughs> and then maybe you can bring them to chant Hare Krishna. It's so a gradual process. Foolish persons, bewildered by the external energy of Vishnu, do not know the ultimate goal of the progressive search after happiness is to get in touch directly with Lord Vishnu, the Personality of Godhead. So <laughs> that's the goal, to get directly in touch. But not everybody's ready for that. So, those who are not ready to get directly in touch with the Lord, then another process is recommended. This is called pantheism, which comes up in text number 20. You can see there text number 20. Uh, let me read it to you. One's mind is always agitated by the passionate mode of material nature and bewildered by the ignorant mode of nature. But one can rectify such conceptions by the relation of Vishnu and thus become pacified by cleansing the dirty things created by them. So, uh, recommending develop the, the relation of Vishnu the relation with the Lord, seeing the Lord in everything. This is the, what is called pantheism. So a neophyte impersonalist is given a chance to realize the relation of the Lord in everything by the philosophy of pantheism. Right? Pantheism is feeling the presence of God in everything, it's seeing everything in the world as having connect, as being part of God, being God. Of course, it's a, a very impersonal philosophy, but there's a higher concept to it. This is uh, describing for the, the neophyte impersonalist. They will see like that. They will see everything as being God. But, of course, God is, you know, the mountain is not God. The mountain is not omnipotent and omniscient. The mountain is impersonal. It's simply the, the energy of the Lord. And so generally the pantheists, they cannot understand the distinction between the energy and the energetic. But it's a beginning. It's, it's a, a way in which somehow the gross materialist can begin to feel the presence of God from the world. You know, some people often say when they go to the countryside, they feel close to God. Or when they go out and here in this scene, you can see the mountain and so on. People may feel close to God in such an environment, such an atmosphere. So this is the vision of the pantheist seeing everything in relation to God. It's a, for the neophyte impersonalist. They begin to realize the relation of God in everything. So, text 15 up to 21, we're seeing, we're getting an overview of what's the yoga process. The yoga process, was, it was described 
you know, first of all, get out of the house and practice brahmacharya, and, you know, control the mind and all of these different things were there. So just, just to take you through what was mentioned in these verses, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur describes about how the, these verses actually describe different stages of what is like Astanga Yoga. And he says this, the first stage, Dira, becoming sober-minded, represents the first stage of Yama, such as Brahmacharya, Yama. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday I was reading Krishna book, he was talking about the, pe the demons were all killed by Krishna and they went to Yama Loka. And so Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, in his purport to it, he said, yeah, they all went to Yama. They, they started to do the, the first stage of the yoga, so it was the beginning of their liberation. He, did, <laughs> he said they're liberated because they were killed by Krishna. But in the purport, uh, well, in the, in the translation, they said Yama, went to Yamaraj. But Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he said that, yeah, the Yama they went to was actually the Yama of the yoga, the beginning of the yoga process, the beginning of their liberation. So, preparing oneself for death at the end of life, get out from the home, the first stage practice yama, the second stage yam niyam, bathing in the holy rivers, represents the second stage. Right? First stage things you don't do, you give up. So you give up the association with the other sex. And then the second thing, the things you have to do, niyama, go and bathe in the holy rivers, visit the holy places and bathe in the holy rivers there. And then the third stage, asana, sitting on the asana, made according to the rules, made of kusha, deerskin and cloth. This is asana, you should have the proper seat. And then pranayama, chanting the three syllable combined as om, in the, is, is the fourth stage. Om, A-U-M, the three syllables, so om, actually sometimes said one syllable. Om, Hari Om, <laughs> three syllables, four syllables. Anyway, pranayama, controlling the prana. And then, by the controlled mind, one should withdraw the senses, such as the eye and ear, from the sense objects, such as sound. This is the fifth stage, pratyahara. Pratyahara, detaching oneself, right? controlling the mind, withdraw the senses. That's the fifth stage. And then the sixth stage, the mind whose assistant is the intelligence which discriminates should then concentrate with intelligence on the form of the Lord. That is the sixth stage of dharana. The seventh stage, dhyana, is described. We should meditate on the individual limbs of the Lord. Engaging the mind, which is without contact with sense objects, one should not think of anything else. This is the Brahman, the form of the Lord, in which the mind is pacified. This is the eighth stage, Samadhi. So, in this way, one can achieve perfection. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is given this in his commentary on this section of the Srimad Bhagavatam. He said Sukadeva Goswami is describing these stages that one is preparing for death or one is detaching oneself from the material world. He can practice like that, go through these different stages. So this was uh, text 16 up to 21. <coughs>
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. May I ask a question? But you're supposed to raise your hands, Maharaji. You know, if you want to ask questions, you please raise your hands. And then we have a devotee there who's assigned to inform me that somebody's raising their hand. Yes, Maharaj, that's me. So, Hare uh, I have been assigned to start, so... So you have to tell me that you want to raise your hand? Yes, Maharaj. I would like to ask a question, if it's okay. Well, I'm not ready for questions yet. You could wait a little while. Okay, Maharaj. All right. So uh, if you see the purport to text number 20, Prabhupada is talking about the pantheism there. And he's describing the, how, how the, the pantheist philosophy helps people in the beginning to come to God consciousness. Prabhupada writes, to acquire such a qualification of God realization in the personal feature, the neophyte impersonalist is given a chance to realize the relation of the Lord in everything by the philosophy of pantheism. Pantheism in its higher status does not permit the student to form an impersonal conception of the Absolute Truth. So understand there's different stages, different levels of pantheism. There's, uh, in one purport Prabhupada describes it as mature pantheism and immature pantheism. So immature pantheism, talking about the impersonal conception of the Absolute, but the mature pantheism will be on the higher status and it doesn't allow the student to have the impersonal conception. And Prabhupada explains, he said, it extends the conception of the Absolute Truth into the field of the so-called material energy. Everything created by the material energy can be dovetailed with the Absolute by an attitude of service, which is the essential part of living entity. And the pure devotee of the Lord knows the art of converting everything into its spiritual existence by the service attitude. And only in that devotional way can the theory of pantheism be perfected. So this is the theory of pantheism is perfected in the devotional way. When we develop that service attitude, there must be the attitude of service. That is the real success of contemplating the universal form of the Lord. And then text 21, Sukadeva Goswami describes, by this system of remembrance and by being fixed in the habit of seeing the all good personal conception of the Lord, one can very soon attain devotional service to the Lord under his direct shelter. So again, Prabhupada talks about pantheism in the purport, and he describes pantheism or the system of feeling the presence of the Almighty everywhere is a sort of training of the mind to become accustomed to the devotional conception. And it is this devotional attitude of the mystic that makes possible the successful termination of such mystic attempts. So training the mind, this is the idea. And the, the pantheistic philosophy is meant to develop into devotional service. Not, not immediately, but as we go on contemplating everything in relation to the Lord, then one should develop the attitude that there is the Supreme Being behind everything. The impersonalists, they see simply the energy of the Lord. They simply see everything as matter. But the devotee 
understands matter in relation to Krishna. They see it as Krishna's energy. For the impersonalists, they cannot understand that so well. They don't, they don't, first of all, they don't recognize Krishna as the Supreme. They don't think of any Supreme Being. They think, simply think of the Brahman. And so they see everything as the Brahman. So the, the immature pantheists, they see everything in that way. But the mature pantheists, they will see that there's not just energy, but it's God's energy. And it's meant to be used in the service of God. So that is the perfection of pantheism. When they see everything in the world as the energy of God, and they will use, utilize it for the service of the Lord. All right, before we go on to the universal form, we can take some questions. So how many hands are up? Mataji. Yeah, this is Kavirupa Radhika Mataji. Please ask a question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam. You are able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mataji. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Maharaj, you just mentioned about the gradual process of attaining to the Supreme Lord. Uh, like, uh, like me, I have not followed the gradual process. Is that the reason we are finding it very difficult to control our mind and uh, because we are, we are following so many processes to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and uh, we are meditating upon the, uh, on the Lord but we are unable to control our mind. But the, whatever the yoga process that you have explained about the steps like uh, dhyana and everything, with that we could have controlled the mind and we could have achieved that quality of the chanting more better way, Maharaj? Well, how much, how much of that process could we actually follow? You know, the, eight, the Astanga Yoga system, the eight stages, actually it's all there within the practice of Bhakti Yoga. You follow the process of bhakti yoga and all of these different stages are there within our bhakti yoga. So controlling the mind, that's going to take longer time, of course. But you've learned to control your senses and then gradually the mind will also become submissive. It's going to take practice, it's going to take training. As Prabhupada spoke about the training of the mind, so just as the pantheists, they train their mind also, well, as devotees, we also have to train our mind. So, it's practice, you have to continue the practice. Conditioned life, we've been in the material world a long time and we're conditioned. And so your mind is reckless, your mind is wild. It takes time to bring the mind under control. It's not going to be immediate. Just like at those eight stages of yoga, it's not so immediate. It takes time. Kardama Muni practiced the Astanga Yoga for 10,000 years. And after practicing, then he got married. Thank you, Mara. Because one more thing you mentioned very clearly that uh, to, to chant it, the, I mean, to control the mind and to chant it very peacefully, you need to get out from home and uh, be in the holy dham in a very uh, quiet environment. But being a grahastha uh, and working here, uh, it is very difficult. There is uh, like uh, in the bhakti yoga, as you rightly mentioned, either we have to be in a grahastha's life and otherwise we have to get out from home and be in the holy dham to chant it peacefully. Am I right, Maharaj? Well, 
to some extent it's right, but at the same time, you can have the Holy Dham also where you are. You can create the mood of the Holy Dham wherever you are. Wherever the devotees are, that is like a Holy Dham. If you have the association of devotees, then that is like a Holy Dham. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yes. Do we have any more questions? Devotees, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead. Maharaj, there's another uh, devotee who would like to ask. Uh, Charanjeeva Sham Prabhu, please ask your question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. Maharaj, just one question on uh, mature pantheism. Um, up to my understanding and the description that we read, uh, mature pantheism still sounds slightly either Semitic or um, not completely according to the Vedic scriptures because mature pantheism still feels like we are seeing Krishna in um, nature or in the creation around us but according to the Vedic understanding uh, uh, what what I understand is that we should see everything around us as a creation or an energy of Krishna so does mature pantheism actually relate uh, to uh, our Vedic conception and how does it correlate is there actually any um, comparison at all well, Prabhupada used this term, mature pantheism, in his purport. So I was just taking it from Prabhupada's purport, that he described it in this way. That if one is following this indirect process, in other words, if you're coming from this level, you're beginning from gross materialist and you're coming into, the, for, beginning with the contemplating the Lord through the material world, through the material energy, through matter. You cannot understand any, anything about the Lord in transcendence. You cannot under, understand the divine form of the Lord. You can simply understand the Lord through the material world, through the matter. Then panthe the pantheist, and the idea of immature and mature pantheism is valid. But for people following, coming to Krishna consciousness and coming into the direct path of devotional service, then it's very different, a whole different thing, right? We don't have to worry about mature pantheism or anything. We, we're already trained to, in the f personal philosophy and to see the Lord in His transcendental form, particularly as we see through the deity. Right, so... Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, we'll go ahead. Oh, oh, we're going to have a discussion here now. So, a quick, it's a quick discussion, not a very difficult question. If Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee, why is he presenting the process of mystic yoga beginning with meditation on the Virat? Would you, someone like to raise their hand to answer this question? Kabir Rupa Mataji is unmute. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, just uh, my understanding, Maharaj, maybe it is wrong. Uh, what I understood is like for the neophyte devotees, like you showed us that if you go and ask some of the devotee to chant, they may not be able to accept with chanting with the beads. So you said like we have to ask them to go through the prana, prana omkara mantra. Maybe they may like to do dhyana with omkara mantra uh, and then meditate upon that virat form of the Lord rather than chanting with the beads and uh, that's what my understanding 
Maybe I am I'm wrong, Maharaj. Okay, okay but why, why is Sukadeva, when Sukadeva Goswami is a devotee, why is he doing this? Because Sukadeva, he's a devotee. Maybe for the neophyte uh, who will not accept the process of bhakti yoga or who may not able to follow up our process of bhakti yoga. Right. Not everybody is able to accept the direct process. Not everyone is able to accept the Lord in the form of a deity. Not if everyone is able to understand how the Lord is a person and he has a, a but he has a, a form, he has a human-like form. So that's difficult for common people. Yes, Maharaj. So for the neophyte, Sukadeva Goswami therefore is presenting this system, mystic yoga beginning with meditation on the Virat for the materialistic inclined person person who is strongly materialistic. So then we ask, since Maharaj Parikshit was already directly connected with the personal feature of the Lord, why did he inquire about that indirect process? Someone else can answer? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, so uh, Maharaj, the answer is related to the first question itself. Like, uh, like Sukhdev Goswami is a devotee, same way Prashant Maharaj is also a devotee. So he is covering up all the questions of you know, new fight people. Your voice is not very clear, Maharaji. Could you speak up? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Maharaj like, uh, Can you speak up? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, is that audible? Yes. So, uh, Maharaj, like uh, Shukdev Goswami is a devotee, Parishit Maharaj is also a devotee, so uh, he is asking this question on our behalf, like for the neophy neophyte people, so that we can get benefit. Do, do you think he wants everybody to to, to uh, take the direct the indirect process? Not everybody, Maharaj. Uh, because he is having every kind of questions, so indirect and direct both questions. Yes. Anybody else like to continue? Shamuna, Sorry, please go. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, my, um, this is uh, speculative, but what I can imagine is, and similar to the lines of the Bhagavad Gita, is uh, the question about the indirect process will help to also, when the direct process is described later on, uh, to clarify what the deficiencies in an indirect process would be like. <laughs> um, okay, uh, you, you, you think uh, for those who follow the personal, who, who take the direct process, they need to hear about the, the problems or the difficulties with that indirect process. Or they need to understand that there's others coming through the other way. Yes, Maharaj, this is just going by the lines of the Bhagavad Gita and how it was developed uh, to actually culminate into Bhakti Yoga. So maybe a similar process, but again, this is speculative. Yes, actually Maharaj Pariksha's reason to inquire about the indirect process is General, he, he's, he's, he's not thinking, of course, for his own self, but he's thinking about others. Just like 
Sukadeva Goswami is uh, presenting the indirect the meditation on the Virat. He's a devotee, but he knows not everyone's a devotee. So similarly also Maharaj Parikshit, he's inquiring about the indirect process because he's aware that there are others there who are, who are, who are not so familiar with the personal feature of the Lord and who are not able to accept the personal feature of the Lord. Even present at the discussion at Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadeva Goswami, they're speaking, discussing Srimad Bhagavatam, there's many others present and not all of them present are devotees and some of them will be impersonalists and so on. And so for their benefit, this is why Maharaj Parikshit is inquiring about the indirect process. You know, there's always people like to do, make things more difficult for themselves. Just like chanting Omkara, it's more difficult than to chant Hare Krishna. You know, some people, they always think, oh, it's, chant Hare Krishna is too easy. They like to do the more difficult things. So, so you get people like that. They want to do every, take everything the more difficult ways. So chanting Hare Krishna, worshipping the Lord, the personal feature, it's a direct process. It's direct, it's easy. But the indirect process, well, it's also there for those who are not able to accept the personal feature. It's there. They can do it. They should hear about it. So Maharaj Parikshit is inquiring about it. How does this process of meditation constitute the first step in God-realization? How can it bring one closer to Krishna? Anyone would like to take up this question? The first step in God-realization, right? That's the title of the chapter. Uh, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Yeah, uh, so Guru Maharaj, I think again, I, it's a kind of speculation, but at least uh, by this process, it's the first step because people will start to think that there's someone about them, whether it's an impersonal feature or not but at least normally people think that we are great and we are all in all but even if they start meditating on something impersonal they at least come to the fact that there is someone superior to them and although they are not conceiving his personality at the moment but at least the fact that we are small and there's something bigger than us so th there's like a first tendency of appreciating someone supreme yes i think that's nice that's a nice way to look at it that we understand there's some higher force, something greater than our own level of existence. So this is like a, an awakening, coming to that kind of understanding that there is something above us and just getting people out of the, the bodily concept of life and just thinking only of their own sense gratification. They begin to under they begin to actually contemplate that there's something above, there's some controlling forces within nature, within the world. And one will, we hope they can go on from that and to come to understand ultimately that there's a supreme personality of Godhead. So different levels of realization. We have Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. So this first chapter is bringing us, you could say, to Brahman realization. In chapter 2 we'll hear about Paramatma realization. So different steps in coming to God realization. Okay, what is, what is, what, what, what is the, the benefit of being aware of the universal form. Here's a quotation from Prabhupada's purport, text number 22. 
purport. These dirty things of fruitive work and empiric philosophy can be removed only by association with the Supreme Lord. The Lord, being omnipotent, can offer His association by His inconceivable potencies. Thus, persons who are unable to pin their faith on the personal feature of the Absolute, are given a chance to associate with his virata rup, or the cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord. The cosmic impersonal feature of the Lord is a feature of his unlimited potencies. Since the potent and potencies are identical, even the conception of his impersonal cosmic feature helps the conditioned soul to associate with the Lord indirectly and thus gradually rise to the stage of personal contact. So in this way Srila Prabhupada describes for us the process of which we begin to contemplate the Lord. In the beginning the contemplation is indirect and gradually we'll come to the stage of personal contact. People, they, they're, they can't put their faith on, the, on the, the personal form of the Lord. They cannot understand someone like Lord Krishna, Lord Rama. They, they, it's just beyond their, their power. They've heard so many problems, so many things about it. They have so many doubts. So let them just associate with the virata rup, the impersonal feature. And in this way they understand something of the unlimited potencies. Right? We have to understand achinja shakti, that there are these inconceivable potencies. And then gradually they begin to understand more that this, this, this achincha shakti is coming from a person, the shakti, somebody's energy, who is the source of that energy. And this way they can come to the personal contact with the Lord. From text number 24, Purport Prabhupada describes a favour to the neophyte. The virata rup manifestation of the Lord is simultaneously a challenge to the atheist and a favour for the asuras who can think of the Lord as virat and thus gradually cleanse the dirty things from their hearts in order to become qualified to actually see the transcendental form of the Lord in the near future. This is a favour of the all-merciful Lord to the atheists and the gross materialists. Prabhupada said, simultaneously a challenge to the atheist and a favour <laughs> for this. Would someone like to tell me, why is it a challenge to the atheists? Anyone? Jati Rupani Mataji, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tandrat Pranams. The, because maybe they are not believing in uh, the personal form of the Lord. Yes, right, definitely. <laughs> They're atheists, right? They're atheists, so they don't believe in God in any form. They don't believe in God in any form. But when they see the Virata Rup, then it's a challenge to them. Because what's this? They don't believe in God, then what's this Virata Ru? How can they explain it? So this is the favour of the Lord to the atheists and the gross materialists, that He actually appears, He, sh he shows this form, which is material form, is matter. So a favour to the neophytes. Here's a couple of quotations from, first of all, from Bhagavad Gita. 
The common man who has no love for Krishna cannot always think of Krishna. Therefore, he has to think materially. Because materialists cannot understand Krishna spiritually, they are advised to concentrate the mind on physical things and try to see how Krishna is manifested by physical representations. Right? Common men, no love for Krishna. They cannot think of Krishna. They're not going to go to temple. They cannot understand Krishna spiritually. They're not, it's beyond them. So they're advised to concentrate the mind on physical things. Actually, then the second quote, actually all such descriptions are for the neophytes. The neophytes cannot conceive of anything beyond matter. The material conception of the Lord is not counted in the list of his factual forms. <laughs> right? The material conception, meaning the universal form of the Lord, is not counted in the list of his factual forms. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, third chapter, purport of verse number 30. Then Prabhupada speaks, text 26, about the importance of developing the right attitude, the service attitude. And without developing that service attitude, then contemplating the virata rup is useless. Prabhupada explains, the conception of the universal form of the Lord gives a chance to the materialist to think of the Supreme Lord. But the materialist must know for certain that his visualization of the world in a, a spirit of lording over it is not God-realization. The materialistic view of exploitation of the material resources is occasioned by the illusion of the external energy of the Lord. And as such, if anyone wants to realize the supreme truth by conceiving of the universal form of the Lord, he must cultivate the service attitude. Unless the service attitude is revived, the conception of virat realization will have very little effect on the seer. So Prabhupada is pointing out, it's not just so easy that you just contemplate the universal form. But in addition, when we, as we contemplate the universal form, there must be that mood of developing the service attitude, recognizing that there's a superior power, a, a divine personality, something over over our own level of existence. So, this is an important point which Prabhupada made there. Okay, going on to this last section, conception of the virata rup, the gigantic form. From the purport of text 24, this gigantic manifestation of the phenomenal world as a whole is the personal body of the Absolute Truth. The gigantic manifestation, we, the vision of the Virata Rupa is to see it as the personal body of the Absolute Truth. So we want, we want to understand everything in the world in relation to the Absolute Truth. So described here, again, text number 26, persons who have realized it have studied that the planets known as Patala constitute the bottoms of the feet of the Universal Lord, and the heels 
and the toes are the Rasatala planets. The ankles are the Mahatala planets and the shanks constitute the Talatala planets. So these planets are all situated in the bottom of the universe. And so in relation to the universal Lord, the body of the Lord, they're described as being like that, as being the feet, the heels, the shanks, the ankles. So putting these different planets into parts, relating them to different parts of the universal Lord the form of the Lord. Text number 36 goes on to describe varieties of birds are indications of his masterful artistic sense. Beautiful, so many beautiful birds, they're very colorful. You can see that, and they're described here this is the artistic sense of the Lord. Then the ocean is his waist, and the hills and mountains are the stacks of his bones. Everything in the universe, we can see it in relation to the Lord. The rivers are the veins of the gigantic body. Trees are the hairs of his body. And the omnipotent air is his breath. The clouds which carry water are the hairs on his head. The terminations of days or nights are his dress. And the supreme cause of material creation is his intelligence. His mind is the moon, the reservoir of all changes. So, a question. Is the universal form material, transcendental, or simply imaginary? After reading Srila Prabhupada's purport to Bhagavad Gita 11.5 and 11.45, try to reconcile them. All right? So, everyone, do you have a Bhagavad Gita? Anyway, something you should be able to check, please. 11.5 and 11.45. And what does Prabhupada say about the universal form? Yes? Hare Krishna? What does Prabhupada say in 11.5 about the universal form? Hare Krishna Maharaj. It is mentioned that in 11.5 uh, uh, that uh, Krishna's universal form, which is also a transcendental form. Okay, he says it's transcendental. Does he say anything else? Yes, so just manifested for the cosmic manifestation and therefore the subject to the temporary time. 
Of his material nature. So temporary. Yeah. All right. And then 1145, what does Prabhupada say? Thank you, Shamaraj. So here, um, Arjuna, after seeing the universal form, is actually telling Krishna that uh, his mind is disturbed and he wants the Lord to come in his original form. <laughs> and also he's started to feeling, oh, he's God, you know, he's great. I was like a friend to him. Now, maybe no. if I've done some offenses to you, no. so, you know, he's developing that different kind of a different kind of relationship with Krishna now. Okay. And also here it's mentioned again that it's material and temporary. Okay, that's what we want. Right, it's material and temporary. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it was meant, Prabhupada mentions it's material and temporary. 11.5 he said it is transcendental. Okay, and then Compare these with Srimad Bhagavatam 1.330 and 2.536 purports. What does Prabhupada say in 1.330? No, Mataji, it was the prior questions. I didn't uh, put down my hand. Sorry, Mataji. <laughs> no. uh, the one, three, one three says the conception of the Virat universal form of the Lord as appearing in the material world is imaginary. Okay. It is to enable yes. the less intelligent and neophyte to adjust to All the right. idea Alright, okay, the... that's enough. We got enough. It's imaginary. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. And what does he say in 2536? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Uh, here in the purport it is written, although universal form is uh, imagined by the great uh, philosophers in the line of, uh, is the one of the features of the Lord. It is uh, more or less imaginary. Imaginary, okay. Thank you. So, is the universal form how do we understand this? Is it material, transcendental, or imaginary? We could say it's everything. Final conclusion about the nature of the universal form. What is your conclusion, someone? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, Maharaj as uh, uh, so far I have understood is that uh, the form of uh, the, the Lord is uh, spiritual but uh, for us it's like uh, we are temporary, I mean in this uh, the material world is temporary so uh, we can see uh, that, that for us it manifests and uh, again uh, I mean non-manifest so it goes like that. So it's uh, both in, in that way. That's what I understood. You understand that the body of the Lord is sometimes manifest and sometimes not. It, it, because the material nature manifests and Because it's manifest. material. Yes. Is it, so yes. the body of the Lord, the universal form is material? It's actually my spiritual only because Krishna, Krishna uh, I mean, everything uh, is spiritual only, whatever related to, uh, to the Lord. Well, we never heard anywhere that it was spiritual. Prabhupada always said the universal form is a material form. But at the same time, he does say it's transcendental. He did say it was transcendental. 
and it's a, a little, certainly. Anybody else? Hare Krishna Maharaj Dandavat Pranams. The universal form is temporary and it does not exist in the spiritual world. Yes. Whenever the Lord. Yes. So, like the material world, that is also temporary. Whenever the Lord wants it according to His will, He is actually creating this material world. Similarly, the universal form also temporary one. Okay, it's a temporary form. Is it a, is it transcendental? No, Maharaj, it's a material one. Well, Prabhupada did say it's transcendental. It was quoted from Bhagavad Gita. The it does not in, exist in the spiritual world. Yes, but it can, be, tra can be transcendental. Eternally. Can be transcendental in this world. It doesn't have to be in the spiritual world to be transcendental. Yes. Because it's a form of the Lord. It's trans. Now, who can see this form? Only by the mercy of the Lord, He actually gives divine uh, vision to Arjuna. Yes, right. We could say revelation. By revelation, he reveals himself to who? To Ar only to Arjuna? And few other personalities, few other devotees. To, to devotees, yes. The Lord reveals to devotees. So it's a, it's a form which is revealed to devotees generally. Okay. Here we can see what is the universal form. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, chapter 6, verses 13 to 16. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, by His, par by his partial representation, measuring not more than nine inches as super soul, expands by His potential energy in the shape of the universal form, which includes everything manifested in different varieties of organic and inorganic materials. And so the, it's a, a nice way of describing the universal form. It includes everything, everything both organic and inorganic. It's all there within the, the form of the Lord. So the, the Lord reveals this form to his devotees like Arjuna. Hmm. Other, uh, we know also uh, Sanjay could also see, he was able to describe to Dhritarashtra by the grace of Vyas, he was able to see so certain devotees, they were blessed. They have, they have to be devotees to actually see the universal form of the Lord. It's not a small thing. Now people contemplate it. They may contemplate the Lord as a universal form. But to actually see, to actually see the form of the Lord, then they have to be devotees. And here Prabhupada said the super soul expands in the shape of the universal form. So is the universal form real or imaginary? We heard the were quotes saying that it's an imaginary. The Virat, universal form of the Absolute, is an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are unable to adjust to the eternal two-handed form of Lord Sri Krishna. Although the universal form, as imagined by the great philosophers, 
is one of the features of the Lord. It is more or less imaginary. It's uh, here, Prabhupada saying, more or less imaginary. Uh, some ways it's more, and some ways it's less. It seems, <laughs> so it's an, an imagination of the speculative philosophers who are not able to contemplate the two-handed form. That's Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, fifth chapter, verse number 36. And we have another quote here, which is third canto Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 6, verse number 4. And there Prabhupada has written, the Virata Rup is not, therefore, an eternal form of the Lord exhibited in the spiritual sky. It is a material manifestation of the Lord. The Archavigraha, or the worshipable deity in the temple, is a similar manifestation of the Lord for the neophytes. But in spite of their material touch, such forms of the Lord as the Virat and Archa are all non-different from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. <laughs> so it, it's really difficult to balance everything which Prabhupada is saying. But he does point out the Virata Rup is not one of the eternal forms in the spiritual sky. But then Prabhupada talks about the deity, the Archavigraha that this is a similar manifestation of the Lord for the neophytes. And so we're worshipping the deity, we're also neophytes. But we're, we're taking the easier, it's easier to worship the deity than it is to contemplate the universal form. And it's certainly more direct. So in spite of their material touch, the deity, of course, we could say material elements are there and it's the form of the Lord, but in the same way the virata is also material elements, not, but it's also non-different from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. So is the universal form real or imagination? Any comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam. Uh, as we read in the Bhagavatam Shloka, uh, it is imaginary. Yes. Yeah, that's what it says, that, doesn't it? Yeah, it's imaginary. At the same time, the deity is not imaginary. The form of the deity is not imaginary. And Prabhupada talks about the Virata and the Archa, all manifestations of, from, from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. So there is, some, there is something real there also. We may say it's imaginary, but it's actually, you know, does it mean when Arjuna saw it, he was just imagining it? It wasn't real? Did Arjuna just imagine this happened? Or was it actually there? Did he actually see the Virata Rup? If we say it's imaginary, then Arjuna was not seeing it? Maharaj was seeing Krishna everywhere in spite of whatever calamities his father was putting into. So he sees Krishna's everywhere. In the pillar also he sees Krishna. So Krishna has come as Narsingadev. 
Yes. Krishna is everywhere. Spiritual. So uh, it is spiritual, no? When he sees this. That, but Krishna, that's Prahlad's vision, right? Prahlad sees the Lord everywhere. So what's your point? How you can say it is material, Lord? How you can say the, the Lord is material? <laughs> well, are we saying the Lord is material? We're saying that there is a material manifestation of the Lord. There's a form made of the elements of the world. In the same way the deity, can you say the deity, of course you can say the deity is uh, spiritual, but at the same time it's made from material elements. So the, the, de the Lord enters into the deity, but before the deity is worshipped, the form of the Lord is created in material elements. The, the brass is molded or the marble is carved and then the Lord is invited to appear into the deity. But at the same time you're saying he's everywhere. Well, he's already there in the deity. Well, why do we invite him to come in the deity? We do that, right? We have that ceremony where we invite the Lord to enter into the deity. We go, into, we go to a lot of trouble to do these ceremonies, to invite the Lord to manifest into the deity. But you say, well, he's everywhere. No, he is everywhere, but he doesn't reveal himself everywhere. But we want the Lord to directly appear and to reveal himself in the deity. So it's a special case. It's how, how to adjust it? Yeah, the Lord is everywhere, so we don't need to worship any deity, we'll just worship everything, anything, you can worship everything. The Lord is everywhere. Of course, it's not like that. We worship the deity because the, 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 we personally invite the Lord to appear in the deity. At the same time, the Lord is everywhere. Well, the Lord appeared everywhere for the, for the benefit of Prahlad, because Prahlad said, yeah, he's also their father. And therefore, Lord Nishingadeva appeared. At the request of his pure devotee, the Lord can manifest everywhere. But generally, the Lord is everywhere present in the form of the, what's the super soul? He's there in the form of the super soul. Some more quotes. Is the universal form real or imaginary? It is merely the temporary imaginary resemblance of his personal form within the kingdom of Maya. In the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, as well as in the second canto, the universal form of the Lord is clearly explained to be an imaginary form offered to the neophytes for meditation on God. This is, that was 11th canto, chapter 3, verse 12. And now 11th canto, chapter 5, verse 2. Similarly, the virata rupa, or universal form of the Lord, is an imaginary form meant to help the gross materialists gradually understand the position of the personality of Godhead. So again, I'm imaginary has been used here several times by Prabhupada describing the form 
the Virata Rupa as some imaginary form. Okay, the form seen by Arjuna is a manifestation by Krishna's internal potency. The form is contained within Krishna's two-armed form. This is a quotation from Surrender Unto Me, Bharijan Prabhu's commentary on Bhagavad Gita. And then he said, only the pure devotee can see that form. From Bhagavad Gita, 11th chapter, takes 48 purport. So the form seen by Arjuna is Krishna's internal potency. So that's not material. That's definitely a transcendental potency. And only the pure devotees can see that form. Krishna doesn't reveal himself to everyone. Naham prakasya sarvadma yoga maya samavrata. Krishna said, I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my eternal creative potency. So Krishna revealed this universal form to Arjuna at, at Arjuna's request. Arjuna actually asked the Lord to show this form, to convince, or as a challenge you could say to the atheists, right, Prabhupada said. A devotee is not much interested in the universal form, for it does not enable one to reciprocate loving feelings. From Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, text 49, purport. So, so many different quotes are there. <laughs> it's very difficult to resolve everything, how actually we should understand these things. I have a lot more quotes. You can go through Prabhupada's books if you like. There are many, many different quotes, different things Prabhupada says about the universal form and how we should understand it. It's certainly a challenge to balance everything. Okay. Those who are impersonalists are also imagining that they are seeing the universal form of the Lord. But from Bhagavad Gita we understand that the impersonalists are unable to see the universal form of the Lord. They're not seeing it because they're not devotees. So that's an interesting point Prabhupada's bringing up. How to understand this universal form? The important point is it's meant to bring about devotional service. His Virata Rup exists and is all pervading. However, the Lord shows that form only to whom he chooses. So here Prabhupada said the Virata Rupa exists. In other places he was saying it's imaginary. All pervading. The universal form is all con also considered personal, though not human. Malati said, 
what class of impersonalists are worshipping the universal form? And Prabhupada replies, well, universal form is not impersonal, that is personal. That is also manifestation of Krishna. Then Malati said, but you say that in one of your purports you are saying that the impersonalists are worshipping the universal form. And Prabhupada said, they are advised, they are advised to worship the universal form. And then Shamsundar Prabhu, who was Malati's husband at that time, says, ah, advised to worship. So in other words, the impersonalists are meant to worship the universal form. And we should understand the universal form is not impersonal, but it is personal. It's a manifestation of Krishna. So these are some interesting points for us to contemplate in understanding the universal form of the Lord. How a devotee sees creation? This is a famous verse. This is actually the vision of the Uttama Adhikari. Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe you know this verse. Stavara Jaigama Deke Nadeke Taramurti Sarvatra Hayanija Istadeva Spurti. The advanced devotee certainly sees everything, mobile and immobile, but he does not exactly see their form. Rather, everywhere he immediately sees manifest the form of the Supreme Lord. You were quoting, somebody quoted the example of Prahlad Maharaj how Prahlad Maharaj sees everywhere the form of the Supreme Lord. He doesn't exactly see everything, doesn't exactly see their form, but he immediately sees manifest the form of the Lord. Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya 8, 274. Okay, so let's look at what we're supposed to learn from this lesson, the objectives. The progression of Sukadeva Goswami's instructions. The progression. Why is he describing Bhakti Mishra Yoga? with meditation on the Virat as its beginning stage. So we explained, right, what was the reason, Sukadeva Goswami, why did he describe this process? Thank you, Maharaj, uh, for the neophytes. Yes, for the neophytes, and particularly for the materialistic people who cannot understand the transcendental form of the Lord. They have to understand things in terms of matter, in terms of the material world, and then they can begin to contemplate the higher powers in the world. So he was describing Bhakti Mishra Yoga. There was some devo devotion mixed with yoga, meditation on the Virat in its beginning stages. So why is Parikshit interested in hearing it? 
Anyone? Vasana Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Bandwath Pranams. It is because Parikshit Maharaj is a pure devotee of Lord and he wants that everyone should benefit from the discussion which was happening there. So people who have materialistic attitude or materialistic mind, uh, to include them also in the discussion and so that they can also benefit from it, he is trying to address different questions at different levels. Oh yes, very nice, yes, for everyone's benefit, right, good, okay. And then we describe the main features of the universal form. The main features of the universal form. Can you remember some of these different features of the universal form? Shamalani Mataji. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaji. So um, it's temporary, it's transcendental, imaginary. Yes. What about some features, though? Uh, Krishna can manifest and unmanifest. Yes. Latin Rupani Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, the word pronounced. So there is a uh, mention that uh, different planetary systems is also the body of the Supreme Lord. Yes. Upper planetary system and lower planetary How these were relating to different parts of the shanks, <laughs> like that, different parts of the, the feet of the Lord, the lower planets. And similarly, if you go up the universal form, you come to the upper planets, you know, Mahaloka, tap, uh, Tapaloka, Satyaloka up here, then these higher planets there are also parts there on, on the, the head of the Lord. Yes, some more features of the Lord's universal form? Kabiruka Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I think we just now concluded that universal form is not impersonal, it is personal. Basically, it is the manifestation of Lord Shri Krishna. Yes, very good. Yeah. Yes, it's personal. Why do the impersonalists like to contemplate the universal form? Why is it so attractive to them? The impersonalists are very fond of contemplating the universal form. Why is it? What's their purpose? Sorry, Prabhu, your voice is not clear, Prabhu. Organic and inorganic matter? Well, yeah, the universal form has everything organic and inorganic in it. Everything is there within it. But I don't know what, why, why are the impersonalists so attracted to that? Right? My question is why, why the impersonalists are so fond of the the universal form. Devotees, we're not very much attracted to it, but the impersonalists are very attracted to the universal form. Vandana Mataji. Oh, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I'll just try. Maybe because the materialists they perceive everything in materialistic context, they do not accept anything beyond materialistic nature. So because of that, uh, when this form, the Virat form, it shows the, the, the different aspects uh, of material nature, 
in their uh, in their highest uh, kind of um, uh, highest form they are able to understand it little bit they can perceive it because it's in their and within their understanding yes something we can correlate this understanding in which they can perceive they can actually relate to it as you say but something but I think there's something else also which is especially attractive to the impersonal that it's actually uh, temporary that the universal form is made up of the elements which are temporary and ultimately they think ultimately there's just simply the oneness there'll be the merging the oneness so this is how the impersonalists view the ultimate absolute truth they think ultimately there's only the oneness the just merging of everything so this is why they prefer to contemplate the universal form because they see the universal form as being also temporary and ultimately there's nothing ultimately there's and so this is in line with their con their uh, impersonal philosophy uh huh so different features of the universal form nobody really identified the different aspects the different phenomena of the material world and what they represent in the universal form we heard only the planets the lower planets and some more things from the universal from the universe which are described there in the universal form Vandana Mataji. Yeah, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, it says that like the, the ocean represents represents the waste, the rivers and streams they represent the veins of uh, the blood vessels or the veins. Okay, the, the rivers and streams are the veins of the universal form, yes. And the ocean is the waste, yes, good. So, and, yes, go ahead. And then the, the, the trees, they represent the hair. The hair, where? Hair on the, uh, on the body. The hair on the body are represented by the, the trees, are representation of hair on the body of the universal form, yes. And, and then the, the bones, the bones, they represent, um, I'm forgetting that, the Maharaj. The, the bones, the mountains, mountains, yeah. The stacks right. of bones are the mountains, and then also. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, there is one more thing. Varieties of birds are the indication of this merciful artistic signs of uh, the Lord. Birth the Lord. Okay. Yes. Good. So some of the different features. We see also what is the sun. The eyes of the Lord, right? The sun is the eye of the Lord. Yeah. Night and day are the dresses. And the moon is the mind of the universal form. Okay. And yes? Okay, I think you. There you go. You have someone? Yes. Form is a luminary planetary systems. His neck is a Mahara planets. Right. Okay, yes, and that's also a well known feature. Yeah, the arms of came out from the head, who came out from the arms, who came out from the, the waist and the legs. They're all features of the universal form. The brahmanas come out from the head. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Sure. Shatrina from the arm. Yes. And Vantinapu from the abdomen and uh, lower portion from the sh uh, from the shudras. Okay, right. So this way we identify the different main features of the universal form.
Let me explain about the importance of developing service attitude and respect for God's creation as opposed to the exploiting mentality typical of conditioned souls. So accepting that the, the contemplating the universal form, it should inspire us to develop this proper mood of devotional service, developing the service attitude. Understanding that we're not the supreme in the universe, right? That we, we're so full of false ego and ahankar, we're thinking we're very great and very important and we don't have the right service attitude. And so when we don't have that right service attitude, then we don't have respect for the creation of God. And we think the world is just there for our exploitation. Described in Bhagavad Gita, that in addition to this material energy of mine, there's another energy which are all living entities who are trying to exploit the resources of the material creation. We are thinking because we are superior, because we are the para-prakriti as opposed to the apara-prakriti, we are thinking the inferior prakriti, all the elements of the material world are there just for our exploitation. And we think we can do whatever we want, we can cut all the trees, we can break down all the mountains, we can do whatever we like, we can go against the creation. And so this is, of course, creating havoc in the global economy, in the global, in the structure of the, the universe, the structure of the planet. Everything is being ruined by man. Everything was arranged perfectly by God, but man comes along and destroys everything. Why? Because we don't have that service attitude. We don't have respect for the Lord's creation. So contemplating the universal form, it's meant that the idea is that we will develop a service attitude and learn to actually respect the material world, not to see it as just being there for our sense gratification. And then the benefits of meditating on the universal form for those unable to appreciate Krishna's personal form. Yes, what's the benefit? That was nicely explained for us, I think. Nanda Kishore Prabhu described. Anyone else like to tell us more? Meditating on the universal form has what benefit? We're not able to appreciate Krishna's personal form, but if we can meditate on the universal form, what will be the benefit? Thanks, Maharaj. Uh, they will slowly understand the uh, position of the personality of God gradually. <laughs> that that will take quite a while, <laughs> quite a while, I think. <laughs> you know to actually understand Krishna's position as the personality of God. We hope that will happen, but, you know, I'd like to know more about the initial benefits. The as we learned in the previous uh, uh, in this class, uh, we are indirectly associating with the Lord and that will uh, clear the dirty things in the heart. Yes, we we'll clear the dirty things in the heart. Indirectly, we associate with the Lord. Right? So, clear the dirty things from the heart. Hopefully, we will become, we'll have what, peace of mind and be able to contemplate more the nature, the nature of life, the, perp the goal of life. Meditate more on the contemplating the universal form, we should understand there must be some creator there. You know, in the beginning someone may be simply atheistic, they cannot understand that there's a God in the world, they don't believe in God, 
And they can't understand, certainly, have no appreciation for the personal form of the Lord. But if they can meditate on the universal form, then they can begin to contemplate that there's some very powerful divine beings behind the universe who are responsible, who are arranging and creating everything. There's so much design within the universe. We contemplate the, the world, when we look at all the different arrangements, the different living entities, and how they're all there, and how they're all provided for. They're all, all the different elements of the nature, universal form are there, different living entities, everything is there within the universal form. So where did it all come from? There must be somewhere, someone behind it. And so we, we cannot understand who or what, but we understand anyway there's some kind of divine energy and we begin to contemplate like that. And in this way we become more appreciative of the world in which we live in and we think more about a higher purpose to life which we hope will gradually bring them to appreciate the personal form of Lord Krishna. Then describe the nature of the universal form as a temporary but transcendentally surcharged personal manifestation of Krishna. So we were hearing that, that the universal form is a personal form of, it's Krishna and it's a personal form of Krishna. At the same time it's temporary, but it's also transcendental. So <laughs> we, were, we were trying to balance all of these things, that it's temporary, transcendental, personal, and it's Krishna himself, a manifestation of Krishna. This is our conclusion about the universal form. Okay, are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, just one question uh, you just now mentioned, explain the benefits of meditating on the uh, universal form of the Lord um, for those who are unable to understand the personal form of the Lord. We just now said that universal form is not impersonal, it is personal. So how do we, how do we materialistic, materialist who don't understand the Krishna's personal form, but they can, or impersonalist, they can understand the uh, universal form of the Lord Maharaj? Well, they will understand it impersonally, <laughs> right? They're impersonalists, so they see everything impersonal. And so when they see the universal form of the Lord, they don't think of it as being personal, but actually it is personal. For devotees, we see it as being personal. But because they're impersonalists, because they're still neophyte, they're, because they're just coming from the very basic platform, so they're not able to contemplate the personal aspect of the Lord. So they just simply see the universal form as an impersonal feature. But therefore Prabhupada said, very important, they have, have, they have to develop the mood of service. That mood of actually giving service, that has to be cultivated, that has to be really brought out in presenting the universal form to, the, to these people. That there's a need to do service, that you have to recognize that there's a Supreme and we're under, you see, <laughs> of course, th that's a challenge in presenting this universal form to the impersonalists. So generally, they don't have a service attitude impersonalists. They're not inclined to do service. They want to stop everything. Yeah. Their yeah. process is negation, stopping everything. Because, but we, yeah. we try to engage them. We try to engage them, you know, take prasadam, chant Hare Krishna, you know. 
So it's, it's difficult to bring people out of that impersonal mold. They get lost in there, they get stuck in that. And they don't want to serve. They lose it. They also go for Brahman realization. Am I right, Maharaj? Oh. They also being on that Brahman or Brahman realization, there is no form. Right. They go to the Sayujya Mukti, the it's impersonal not. merging. That's their goal. That's what their goal is. Maha, uh -huh. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Vandana Mataji um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm not able to understand, uh, I'm not able to correlate uh, something here that you said that uh, you, you told Maharaj that in the Chaitanya Charitamrita verse from Madhya Leela 8.274 that an advanced devotee he sees Lord in everything, right? And then in pantheism also. Uh, it was discussed that um, there are two stages, immature and mature. So how, 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 I, how do I correlate these two things, this pantheism and this, um, this verse of Chaitanya Charitamrita? But this verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita, that's describing the very topmost level devotee. Yes, okay. yes. Now pantheism yes. is a very different, a very much lower level of contemplation. Okay, it's, so there's no correlation? No, there's no okay. correlation. The pan okay, okay. pantheist, it's, it's just the, the, the feeling of God. No, but the mature, mature pantheism state... Well, the mature God. pantheism is the, that they understand it's the energy of God. They see the world as the energy of God. Okay, so they are apart, they are not related, basically. Right, they're right. not related, no. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay. Rukhrani Mataji. Mareshna Maharaj, Dandas Pranam Maharaj. My question is based on this statement, is the universal form real or imaginary? Prabhupada quote in that statement, it is more or less imaginary. Uh, uh, am I, my understanding, please tell, uh, let me know, Maharaj, does the Lord is eternal, he has an... Uh, Sachit Ananda Vigra of 200, very beautiful song. Since these mental speculators, they speculate, they imagine this uh, Virat Rupa based on this material universe. Uh, is it this, uh, uh, it is, uh, they are saying it is imaginary. When, when we progress in devotional service, the people should not uh, stick on to this uh, Rupa as one of the form of the Lord. Why I am asking this means? Lord is transcendental, He is eternal, He has this form, but whatever the form He is taking is also eternal and transcendental. And here it is also quoted, it is transcendental, it is temporary. But again, why it is imaginary? Since they are imagining, based on this material concept, Lord doesn't want this form as real, since people will be misguided. Is this the reason, Maharaj? How to understand this, Maharaj? <laughs> uh, you're, you're really asking a lot from me, I don't know. <laughs> no, that imaginary is always confusing because the Lord is transcendental, is eternal. Whatever form is always eternal, it should be eternal, right? Why is it saying imaginary? It should be real, temporary well, and real. Imaginary, real. In, imaginary in the sense that you're taking yeah. everything, you're taking the different you know, elements of the material creation, as we said, all the different planets and so on, and putting them into the body, imagining them to be part of the body, and imagining the rivers and the mountains in their different ways. And so we're imagining, imagining it all in the form of a body, right? So some people are imagining, it, there is an imaginary concept of the Virata Rup. But there, are, there is also the Virata Rup, which is actually shown to Arjuna. There is a it's real Virata Rup, yeah. which is shown only yes. to the devotees. Okay. Right? So to yes, those Maharaj. pure devotees, they see the Virata Rup, but others they just imagine. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. So for the devotees, he will show his real form, real universal form. Yeah. Whereas for the others, it is not the real, imaginary. Is that the correct understanding, Maharaj? 
Well, that's how I Thank understand you so <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Mother. Thank Hare, you so much. Hare Krishna. Yes? Bhagavan Ji Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Mahesh. Uh, see, we, these are all the material elements, all planetary systems, ocean, various items we have seen. That Those are the features of the Lord. Okay, those are material. But uh, he also shows to Arjuna the Kala Rupa form. So how do we understand that? That is material or, I mean, how do we classify that? The That's material. Kala Rupa form. Well, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, that is a material form. The Lord showed, well, he's showing the future to Arjuna. He wants to encourage Arjuna in the battle, right? But yes, Kala Rup form of time, definitely, that we would consider that to be also a material form. But at the same time, transcendental, because it's the Lord's potency. By the potency of the Lord, he's able to show that. Jamuna Sevika Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, related to the same question of uh, uh, Mataji, which she asked about the image, the Virat Rupa imaginary form. Uh, there were there are two doubts which I had here. We mentioned that the image, the Virat Rupa form, was shown for the neophyte devotee to uh, understand the Lord's form and. Uh, but then on the next statement, it was also mentioned that only a pure devotee can see the Virat Rupa form. So how is it like it is for the neophyte, but a pure devotee can see it? And the second doubt which I had was, it was also mentioned in the same sentence that it is uh, the Virat Rupa is the imaginary transcendental resemblance. So the word resemblance means there has to be some original form which resembles the Virat Rupa form. Like the Virat Rupa form is a resemblance of something original. So if there is a resemblance, means Virat Rupa form is real. Yes, Virat Rupa form is real. We said it's real. We said. Yeah, but I mean, we also mentioned that only the neophyte it is, it is it was for the neophyte devotee. But again, it was also mentioned that only the pure devotee of the Lord can see the Virat Rupa. Right, the pure devotees they actually see the real Virat Rupa. Krishna reveals to them. And the neophytes, they contemplate the Virata Rupa. They contemplate the Virata Rupa. They don't actually, you know, they're, they're trying to understand something higher. It's a different thing. What the neophytes actually do, they imagine the form of the, the Lord. Right? They imagine the consider the different elements of the material creation, put them together in the form of a universal body. So they conceive like that. They conceive by the power of their minds, their imagination, they're putting these different elements into the universal form. But there is the Virata Rup, which Krishna reveals to his pure devotees. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any more questions, devotees? Maharaj, I think that's it. Okay. No more questions. All right. Thank you so much, so we'll, Maharaj. We'll be back on Tuesday night to go on to Chapter 2. So please look over Chapter 2. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Gorbak Devrinda Ki, Gorbak Primanandi.